Welcome, and today we're going to have a look at fountains of the old world and ask ourselves whether it would have been possible for them to build these fountains in this old time period. And more importantly, we'll discuss what may the purpose for these old fountains have been. So I hope you enjoy. Today the world is burning, at least in my little neck of the woods, and I'm kind of out here in the desert. Some trees along these ditches, but typically I'm not really worried about fire, unless it was some kind of selective directed energy fire as seen in California. And if you're targeted for that, there's really nowhere to run. But this making for a beautiful sunset. And I think about fire and water fountains. All these water fountains found all throughout our realm. The most beautiful water fountains. Predating power. Not predating electricity, but the general distribution of it, and yet the importance of these fountains. Were they just for beauty, such poverty and times of past, and yet people had enough resources and desire to build some of the most glorious fountains, things that we don't replicate today. And were they just fountains? Were they just ornamental? We barely understanding anything, let alone how all this architecture and arts and understanding of the past came to be. And especially until recently, having very little knowledge of water and the uses and benefits and potential. Now we come to understand how energy and intentions and frequency can affect water, and especially ourselves being mostly water, and also the ability to restructure water. This being a fairly new concept to me, having recently drank restructured water, and having felt very good for two days. And this water was charged with an electrical energy, restructuring it, in creating much more use to myself and my being as compared to the damaging effects that water would typically have coming out of the tap after it's been abused and so-called purified and ultimately adulterated. And could these fountains, with their glorious antiquitech on top, have been doing just this, restructuring the water creating healing fountains in all the town squares, all throughout our realm again. No shortage of fountains, often surrounding beautiful monuments, and the fountains themselves being monuments, and naturally pumping water in general, healing or not healing, and the ability to pump water, very advanced in these early time periods, very questionable as to whether it would really be possible in very early time periods to be plumbing water in mass volumes into town squares. We're told people still used outhouses and threw their waste out of windows in buckets and yet coexisting with these works of wonder. And coming full circle on this fiery day, in which I can't even see the mountains, usually we'd see them. I think as a great precaution, around a home, one would want a sprinkler system. As some sort of defense mechanism against fire. Perhaps if fire comes sweeping through a city, or in my case, sweeping through the high desert, you fire up your exterior sprinkler system, watering your house down as if it was just raining and protecting against fire. And could these fountains 
have served the same purpose. Could this be the reason why much of this architecture remains? In such reset situations, or if we believe the narrative, such situations where a cow might knock over a candle and burn down a whole city, one could fire up this fountain to full capacity, creating an umbrella of water, protecting the surrounding buildings for as far as you could project and procure water pressure. Where I grew up in Arizona, not too far away, we had the world's or maybe the second or third world's largest fountain. At the time, a small community called Fountain Hills. And I believe it shot up for hundreds of feet. But this same fountain could be adjusted, turned on and off, at will. And let's have a look at some fountains. Obviously, a fountain is a piece of architecture which pours water into a basin or jets it into the air to supply drinking water and add decorative and dramatic effects. Apparently something very important in days of old. Fountains were originally purely functional, connected to springs or aqueducts. Here a little look at what kind of feat a aqueduct can be, especially in older times. Forget about the fountain. This being the most simple part to display some beautiful ornamentation. It's the back end of the fountain that's the big deal. And real quick, let's just look at my favorite fountain in the world, the Schoner Brunnen Fountain. And I've been looking for some pictures of the water spouts coming out here. In some other photos, they looked like cannons, but not in this particular photo. But getting back, until the late 19th century, most fountains operated by gravity and needed a source of water higher than the fountain, such as a reservoir or aqueduct again. In the Middle Ages, Moorish and Muslim garden designers used fountains to create miniature versions of the gardens of paradise. The King of France also used fountains in the gardens of Versailles to illustrate his power over nature. Let's have a little look at that, way over the top, again, this is before a time of heavy machinery and just to scratch this imprint out in the ground and not even build anything would be beyond the needs or the abilities of the people at this time. The Baroque decorative fountains of Rome in the 17th and 18th centuries mark the arrival of restored Roman aqueducts and glorified the popes who built them. And by the end of the 19th century, as indoor plumbing became the main source of drinking water, urban fountains became purely decorative. So this is the part that really seems ridiculous to me. By the 19th century, we have indoor plumbing, and fountains become purely decorative. Fountains, and especially the glorious ones of the past, become obsolete. And I think that this narrative is a complete contradiction. If you're pumping water around for hundreds of miles, in some cases with these aqueducts, not to mention the Roman aqueducts that you have to build perfectly graded slopes to carry these over mountains and unlevel terrain. And yet we're told that this was primitive. Finally, we usher in indoor plumbing as if all of this was not plumbing. As if plumbing just arrives in the 19th century and we're just to assume that all of this in the past was primitive and not fitting into the narrative. Our own people, for the last hundred years using outhouses, building structures and canals and railways, we're told, incredible feats of architecture and engineering and yet using outhouses. By the end of the 19th century, as indoor plumbing became the main source of drinking water, urban fountains became purely decorative. Mechanical pumps replaced gravity and allowed fountains to recycle water and force it high into the air. And here we can see one in Switzerland, near Lake Geneva. Here we can see the largest fountain in the world, 
in Saudi Arabia. This one shoots up 850 feet. The one in Lake Geneva, only 460 feet. And now let's look at ancient fountains. Ancient civilization built stone basins to capture and hold precious drinking water. A carved stone basin dating around 2000 BC was discovered in the ancient Sumerian city of Lagesh in modern Iraq. Here's what they show us. Some old melted brick. And even this is pretty advanced for 2000 BC. Again, if we're to believe any of this. And we're told fountains are found everywhere except in Egypt because there was no source of water higher than the city. Fountains existed in Athens and other Greek cities in the 6th century BC as the terminating points of aqueducts which brought water from springs and rivers into the cities. And this crusty ruler was said to have built the main fountain of Athens. And really just looking like a city on top of a city. And it had nine large cannons, or spouts, which supplied drinking water to local residents. And I just found this really interesting, the nine large cannons, or spouts. Never heard a spout referred to as a cannon before. And let's go back to this Schoner Brunnen fountain. And again, not the picture I'm looking for, but in some depictions what look like cannons sticking out at least four, and perhaps in times of old, they would have dumped into these little basins, and now these are just concrete pillars, it seems like. It seems like the fountain is not even operational, even in this old point in the photo, this very primitive point. Greek fountains were made of stone or marble, with water flowing through bronze pipes, most Greek fountains flowed by simple gravity, but they also discovered how to use the principle of a siphon to make a water spout, a siphon being a natural form of water delivery. And once you get the water moving through a pipe, the pressure created from the pouring water will continue sucking the water out. So rather than a pushing, you end up with a sucking type pressure. I recently saw a modern siphoning project up in the mountains near where I live and they were actually siphoning a massive amount of water up a mountain to a city about a hundred miles away. The ancient Romans built an extensive system of aqueducts from mountain rivers and lakes to provide water for the fountains and baths of Rome. Again, you're piping all of this all throughout the countryside, only to dump it in a fountain. I mean, why stop there? You've built these glorious buildings. Why not just pump it right into the homes and just finish, be done with plumbing? Not wait over 2,000 years for plumbing when you're already there, according to the narrative. The Roman engineers, a little short-sighted. The excavations at Pompeii, which revealed the city as it was, when it was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, uncovered freestanding fountains and basins placed at intervals along city streets. So here in Pompeii, getting a little closer to modern plumbing, actually bringing these water points and placing them at intervals along the city streets, fed by siphoning water upwards from lead pipes under the street. I mean, this is so advanced. You have lead pipes. I don't care what it is. You're not far from casting another type of appropriate metal if you're already casting pipes. Siphoning water upwards. Again, a little more. Just plummet right into the home. And it looks like they do. The excavations of Pompeii also show that homes of wealthy Romans often had small fountains in the atrium or interior courtyard with water coming up from city water supply and spouting into a small bowl or basin. So we're there. We have plumbing according to them in 79 AD. Apparently intelligent enough to pipe it all the way into their home and just not quite figuring out how to complete the task. Ancient Rome was a city of fountains in 98 AD. Rome had nine aqueducts which fed 39 monumental fountains 
and 591 public basins, not counting the water supplied in the imperial household and owners of private villas. Each of the major fountains was connected to two different aqueducts in case one shut down for service. The Romans were able to make fountains jet water into the air by using the pressure of water flowing from distant and high sources to create hydraulic force. Again, super advanced, forget about the fountain. It's the 99% behind the fountain. And this guy was said to have a large swimming pool with water jets. We're also told that this guy describes a banquet room of a Roman villa where a fountain began the jet water when visitors sat on a marble seat. The water flowed into a basin where the courses of a banquet were served in floating dishes shaped like boats. Now, this is just getting stupid, but this is the narrative. Let's have a look at medieval fountains. Still, pre-plumbing, we're told, and here we begin in Nepal. In Nepal there were public drinking fountains as early as 550 AD. And here we can have a look at those. Just absolutely glorious, mind-blowing, and Nepal being very primitive, even today. They consist of intricate carved stone spouts through which water flows uninterrupted from underground water sources. Mind you, Nepal, in the rocky Himalayas, and in 550 AD, these guys are supposed to be trenching wells underground and finishing them off with these beautiful intricacies. In 550 AD, Nepal. Construction of water conduits are considered a pious act in Nepal. Oh, of course, that would explain the impossibility. During the Middle Ages, Roman aqueducts were wrecked or fell into decay. So in the Middle Ages, not even able to maintain what was supposedly built long before, reminding me of NASA losing the telemetry to return to the moon. And this is kind of interesting. Fountains in the Middle Ages were associated with a source of life, purity, and wisdom, and the Garden of Eden. And the garden looking very techy in this depiction. And the cloister of monasteries are supposed to be a replica of the Garden of Eden. Fountains are placed in the center and used as rituals before religious service. And really this article just goes on and on. Medieval fountains, fountains of the Islamic world, Renaissance fountains in the 15th and 17th century. Really nothing looking any more glorious than the next. All equally impressive. And for 2,000 years, the fountain having an important role in the old world. Baroque fountains, just over the top. Something that we barely do today. Seen in places like Las Vegas. Here one in Paris, in 1840. And as always, I just don't think there's the money or resources if we're to believe the historical timeline that we're given. And really the fountains of the old world being surrounded by beautiful art and landscaping and incredible engineering. And these days, even if we do build a glorious fountain, like these seen below, purely a water feature. Nothing beautiful about the place itself. And here we can have a little look at a book in 1709 showing different types of fountain nozzles, which would create different shapes of water, from bouquets to fans. And here a little look at that. 1700s, again predating general plumbing, but yet having the skills and architectural know-how to not only conceive, but forge intricate parts, directing water in different shapes in the 1700s, and writing books about it. And there's so many different directions I'd like to take this video. But before I forget, I just have to show you the effects of this Kangen water, this Kangen water is a charged water hit with electricity and restructuring, again, the molecules. And in turn, when this rendered water is consumed, our insides and cellular structure is freed up and allowed to move freely, and more importantly, free of disease. Can I say that? So here he has a microscope and he drinks a little coffee and then he puts it under a microscope. His blood, that is. 
and we can see how coagulated his cells are. Not moving freely, very sluggish. So now he does the same experiment, but he drinks a little coffee. And the coffee frees up his cells a little more. You can actually see them moving, but still pretty binded. And then he goes in and drinks some regular purified tap water. And mind you, this is first thing in the morning. This particular brand, I think, is made by Coca-Cola. And here you can see his cells look a little better, but still clinging. Clinging to each other and not moving freely. Very sluggish. He drinks a few different types of waters until finally he drinks this special water made in this machine. And I'll leave the link to this video. I really want you to see everything just moving around, how the cells react. And I really like that he did his own research with this super cool modern microscope that has a little screen on the front. So you don't have to shove your eyes into some rubber viewer. And very fascinating to see the results of drinking this water and the way that the cells are able to move freely and are no longer sticking to each other. And I just love this kind of grassroots at home science. And this guy's actually a friend of a friend's. And that's how I was introduced to this channel. And why do I show you this? Again, to tie it into these water fountains. Now, as we know, this is clearly a sign of what we call antiquitech or just ancient technologies, or not so ancient at all. And when we find this antiquitech on top of a water fountain, viewing what we see with our understanding, we really have to ask ourselves why. Why combine electricity with water? And as I just showed you, there is one example. And perhaps water was simply the carrier of this electricity, rather than using wires and make a big mess of the world. And of course I can't say that I know. Only examining puzzle pieces. And I look forward to your comments. What can be certain is that there is much more to these fountains than we've been led to believe. And I really like the idea of the Garden of Eden, or as we would call it, Mount Meru, being a massive fountain, as we saw earlier, shrouded in beauty. And recently, we've seen a man who had a tree or a plant in a jar or a large bottle, as seen here, and didn't water it for over 40 years. And I'm not sure if it happened on accident initially. I think it did. And now people are replicating this, creating a small ecosystem within a large bottle. And do we exist in such an ecosystem? Are we stuck with the same waters that perfectly recycle themselves in our terrarium? Even in a bottle like this, we would have water evaporating and accumulating on the top, only to rain back down. Perhaps there are small clouds that we can't see. And if it were so, and there was a giant fountain in the center of our realm, then this would lend to the idea of our realm being carefully created. So that's it. I do hope you enjoyed, and do have a blessed day. Please like, comment, and subscribe.